Dara Cooperman. I am the I am the electronic resources librarian here at Pratt. The title of the session is e-resources and choice in the elementary school library. And our presenters are two media specialists from Queen Anne's County, Danielle Gray and Heather Lowe. Um, as we've said before, you can use the chat during the session, but if you have questions for Danielle or Heather, please put them in the Q&A feature. The button is in the bottom controls ribbon. So let me introduce our presenters. Heather Gray is the school library media specialist for Queen Anne's County. Um, she's a certified reading specialist with a master's in education from Goucher College. Heather is also held positions as a math specialist, a STEAM arts integration lead teacher, and an elementary classroom educator. Danielle Lowe is also a school media specialist for Queen Anne's County Public Library. She is a certified K-6 classroom teacher and is currently attending the Masters of Art of Art in Leadership, Master of Arts in Leadership, uh, in Leadership of Teaching at Notre Dame of Maryland University. She's previously held positions as an elementary computer technology teacher an intern supervisor in the elementary education program at Salisbury University, and as an elementary classroom teacher. And now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. We're going to share our screen here. Um, welcome to Choice and Motivation, using e-resources to combat learning loss. Um, we are coming to you from the elementary school library viewpoint. So this may feel a little different from what you've experienced in some of your other sessions, but hopefully you can feel our elementary energy today. Um, while a lot of this is seemingly focused on what we do in the elementary school library setting, all of these ideas can carry over to your public setting. Um, and we will try and highlight those as we work our way through today. Um, so um, as um, Sarah had mentioned, I am Heather Gray. Um, I'm not going to go into my, my list of things again, but um, over the last 15-ish years of, of my life, I've been in various roles um, in education, and this is my partner, Daniela. Hi. Um, so I'm Danielle. Like Sarah said, thank you, Sarah, for your intro. Um, I am also, I'm at a K to, well, actually, a next starting next year, we will have pre-K full day, but I'm at a pre-K to second grade um, school um, in Queen Anne's County. I absolutely love working in the library. Um, I have worked with fifth graders and um, I've worked with some middle schoolers and up to college uh, graduates. So, um, and I really love the littles. I'm at K through second. She's with the third through fifth. So we kind of combo up and it's our mission to take on it all. Yeah, so thank yeah. you guys so much for coming to our session today. Um, so our objective today is going to be that participants will increase choice and information access for elementary age students and patrons by utilizing leveled e-resources in order to combat learning loss and increase motivation. We know that learning loss is huge right now as we come out of the pandemic closures. Um, so we're going to address some ways that we can increase motivation today um, so that we can help close that gate on learning loss. So I know that objective is kind of deep and heavy. So in our elementary world, we say, uh, this is how we're going to roll today. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about our mission. So our mission is learning loss and how we can combat it in the library. This is in the library, in the elementary schools, uh, middle school, high school, and in our public libraries. Um, I have a great relationship with um, Julie. She's at our public library. And we work together well. Um, she's trying to get more youth in, and she has taken on some of these ideas of what we're going to show you today. So we hope that this really helps everyone. So that's our mission across the board is not just for the elementary, but to combat that learning loss. Um, the second thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of the science of reading. Um, we won't like bore you with too much of it, but just like the general of what is happening and why we have decided to go in the direction of motivation and choice. Because um, the importance of motivation and choice 
is our reading achievement and what we want to um, these students and this youth to grow. Um, but we need to understand it first before we can do it. Um, thirdly, we're going to talk about why we're here, really. Um, Gail Elementary, Gail in Context, Net Geo. We absolutely love these two e-resources. They have changed the game for us elementary um, teachers and our students love it. They're learning and they're researching and they're investigating these two sites and half the time they think they're just playing. Um, and so that's the great part, right? We're trying to like hide it. Um, so they are, I think you guys will love what we have for you and we love these two. And last but not least, um, we are going to show you how we kind of bring it all together full circle to we have we make choice boards using these e-resources e um, and this definitely helps to increase their success um, with information access. All right, so I always like to start off by setting our intention. So kind of keep this quote in mind as we move through today. Student motivation increases when they have more choices in how they learn, more choices in what they learn, and more choice in who they learn with. And with that said, um, Danielle's going to talk to you about our mission. All right, so what's going on, right? So right now, um, I know we have so many, a lot of people are like, oh, there's a learning gap. There's a learning gap. But why is there that learning gap? So I kind of just figured out a little bit, did some research from what we have been experiencing. And um, I'm a mother of two children. I have a 16-year-old junior uh, in high school, and I have a 13-year-old um, in seventh grade. So I see it on both ends, uh, personally and obviously in the schools. But one of the main things is a major decrease in reading and learning stamina, right? We live in this like um, crazy world of complete automatic, automatic all the time, um, online games, social media, streaming videos. So it's it's becoming more critical because our attention spans are they're shortened. Um, and this is becoming a severe issue when we're talking about reading and learning. This is with children and adults. There's also a major decrease in motivation. Um, I think that sometimes we take on like making a task too hard, or maybe it's too frustrating or not interesting, or it's too easy. And to really, it seems like an easy task to make something manageable challenge. Um, but that's really where we need to look because once your learner figures out the value and the utility of what they're learning and that self-efficacy part, they're going to be like motivated to want to do it. Um, so that's kind of that whole motivation for us is huge. Um, finding those things that interest them. We also noticed that there's an increase in frustration. So um, in reading and learning frustration, um, I have a child who has an IEP and for people um, that may not understand, they, it's an individualized education plan. So she struggles with reading and a lot of it is because of these causes. And we need to find a way to optimize our resources that we're given to kind of meet some of these. So um, I'm just gonna sum up a couple of the causes that I put. So um, optolexia, this is guessing short words or even poor spelling. And I feel like poor spelling is, I mean, we have Google Homes and Alexa. So I'll hear my kids, you know, oh, how do you spell this? And I'm like, come on guys, you know, but um, it's such easy access now to ask, how do you spell this? Or spell check on their phones or on their tablets. And it's becoming a major problem. Even the brightest children, often show a pattern of this problem um, because then it becomes a practice to depend on something, but then it becomes frustrating as they are trying to you know, get college and career ready. Also poor short-term memory. This is just struggling to decode long words, which is a big problem when they are already frustrated. There's eye tracking issues. This is skipping words or whole lines of text we notice in our school, we around 30% of students will do this, um, which makes it difficult and again, frustrating. Um, auditory process weakness, uh, we've looked at that as well. This is somewhat, this is, um, if I could sum it up, it's like difficulty blending their sounds. So we know, I know Heather, um, she'll talk a little bit about too, but um, you know, in the classroom as a teacher, they teach these things, but then we are trying to scaffold and help them with it. But this can often bring on a stress spiral. And we kind of define stress spirals as battles and meltdowns. 
And we know there's been a lot of extra stress in these past couple of years. Um, and we put a lot on these children and it's hard. And we know that reading practice can often turn into a battle and nothing gets learned that way. If you're frustrated, nothing gets learned. And all it does is kind of lend itself to, it perpetuates learning loss, which is our my last little um, key down here. So when the focus is on looking for signs of learning loss, then we have a major risk of missing student strengths and negating the essential link between learning and culture. And I think that is the problem is we a lot of times will focus on learning loss when we really need to focus on, okay, what's their strengths? Um, how can we make this relatable to them? How can we make them feel important and invested, right? They need to be invested in themselves and in what they're learning. So um, that's kind of what's going on right now. So. That leads us into student motivation. So if you guys take a look at this graph, obviously positive atmosphere um, is a definite must, um, positive feedback um, and the teacher's role, but look how large student choice is. So this is 32% is student choice. And you're, the next biggest is your 44%, which is made up of students' questions and their um, learner autonomy. So these, this is all because they were able to have this choice and then they were able to say, okay, what do I want to learn? How can I learn this way? And it motivates them to be successful. Um, so by increasing that choice and the success with their choice and the access to e-resources, like we will talk about today, we can increase the motivation and we will continue to close the gate on learning loss. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science of reading, um, again, not to drag that on, but we have a unique opportunity in the library as opposed to the classroom environment when it comes to literacy. Um, while the classroom teachers and teachers uh, are teaching students how to read, we in the library have a duty and a privilege to teach children how to enjoy what they're reading and take pride in the information that they're gaining from their reading. Um, we're charged with the task of teaching and modeling for students how to utilize reading and their literacy. Um, and this speaks to how we can impact and influence reading and learning motivation. Um, when we talk about the science of reading, most often we um, talk about the act of reading, phonics, um, phonemes, graphemes. Um, but one area that doesn't get talked about a lot is the factor of motivation and the science that lies behind that when it comes to reading. Um, John Guthrie uh, has spent a lot of his career researching um, the science behind motivation and reading and learning, and he and Alan Wigfield out of University of Maryland determined some factors that play a role in reading and um, learning motivation. And they came up with this acronym of SMILE. Um, and these are factors um, that science has shown are most impactful to the development of motivation, particularly in children in the area of reading. Um, and the first one is our S, um, which stands for share. Um, can they use what they're reading to make social connections? The M is for me, is this material promoting their self-efficacy and success? Um, so how are, is it, are they being successful with what they are reading? I as importance is what they are being asked to read, important or relevant. Do they have that feeling that what they're reading is important or relevant? Liking, are they enjoying it? And then E, is engagement and all of these things are going to lead to engagement um, and engagement is a direct product of our motivation. And that's how we begin to close this gate on learning loss. <clears throat> so to summarize that, students who, who share reading feel efficacious as readers, believe reading is important and experience intrinsic pleasure in reading are more likely to invest the time and effort needed to co fully comprehend text. And that's how we're going to increase their reading success. And all of this can be pulled back to choice. Giving students choice will support all of these factors in motivation. And we're gonna talk, continue to talk about that as we work through today. Um, Guthrie explains that good teachers, and I think that this goes into librarians in pu the public setting as well, giving students choice. Um, good teachers are giving five choices every lesson, not just once a day, but every lesson. Five choices bring students' interest, their student competencies, and students' self into lessons and into the activities that we are doing with them. So that brings us to um, Gail Elementary and National Geographic Kids. Woohoo! All right. So, um, 
I will, I do have to say, I was talking to Jody and Sarah beforehand and we have a lot of energy. Like <laughs> el elementary school teachers are like a, a whole nother breed and I like dig it. It's my jam. <laughs> so um, when we can find something that we can use in our lessons, even with the littlest of like humans, these little five-year-olds, um, it's amazing. And we kind of get so excited about it. And uh, when we saw this coming through, we're like, okay, so we would use Gale Elementary. And then we saw that Nat Geo Kids was now a product of it. And we'd already been using Nat Geo Kids. We were like, all right, this is, we can do a lot with this. So um, we are going to, uh, I'm just going to kind of talk about them um, and pinpoint some things. I know that a lot of people, um, I'm sure, know how to get into here, but I'm just going to touch on some things that we love, um, some of the capabilities that the site has. And, um, and Galen Contacts offers an abundance of topics, book titles, news articles, pictures, videos. They've done an excellent job of providing opportunities through the use of these e-resources on so many different platforms. And the thing we love the most is that they come in different levels. Um, so let's explore a little bit and I'm gonna show how it shows um, more increase for reader motivation and choice. All right, so the first is I searched hummingbirds. They're my favorite bird. So um, I decided to use hummingbirds as an example. So when you go to um, Gale and Context Elementary, you can search. So I searched animal, I clicked on animals on the homepage, um, birds, and then clicked on, I typed in hummingbirds. The thing I love most, the first thing I was looking for is um, how many different languages. I see that I can switch from English and I looked up, there's over 30 different languages. I know personally, we have students that come in and English is their second language. And if we really wanna promote this self-efficacy, like where do I belong? Um, I, I know I'm important, but do they, am I important to them, to this school, to this program? And the fact that it offers over 30 different languages makes it feel comfortable, right? You're, as soon as you can promote that confidence, that it's key. So um, I love that it offers over 30 different languages. And it doesn't just translate the article, you'll see it translates the entire homepage. The next is um, the breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs for little humans, let me tell you what, is key because they love a back button. But the problem is they hit the back button and they go like out of the program um, and they'll go all the way back to their homepage. And maybe they just want to go back to birds. So I love breadcrumbs. Down at the bottom, the extras for quick research. Quick facts is great. So it offers three facts. I know we do a little um, animal research with my little guys and I tell them, pick your favorite fact. Well, that's really hard to do when you're little because everything is like super cool. Um, so this is three. So you're giving them that choice, but they get to figure out which one they want. The best is over there on our page options, you can turn the sound on and off. So it can be off and you can have them just focused on one point or you can have it on and they can take their cursor and as they move, it reads it. So they move over that one. It reads the bee hummingbird is the smallest bird in the world. And they kind of, they don't have to be able to read it specifically. These options, I feel like um, are more used by educators and teachers than they are the students, the ones to the right. You can look at your browsing history. You can um, look at highlights and notes, but the best, the key that we love, that we totally like geek out on is getting the link. So um, this is something that's super cool and everything that they have in Gale is you can get a link. A link can be used in the choice boards that we create that we will show you later, um, but they can be in anything. You have a link, you could share it any way you want. A teacher's looking for an article, bam. Um, you have a parent that calls like, oh, my kid is so interested in um, oxalots. All right, let me look it up, share the link. So we love it. Um, the next thing is, so here we have our Hummingbirds article. Where it says keep reading, um, you enter the article. This will give you more options and also the full article. So uh, the next thing in, once you get to that article, this is the coolest. So over on the left, you will see that there are article reading levels. So um, each box is leveled by a color and by a dot. So um, Level one and level two is here. So they are leveled by Lexile levels. So the one dot is 
500. So that's approximately like kindergarten, your first graders. Um, I only show up to level two on mine because I was under my Ken Island Elementary School account. I only teach to second grade. And two dots is Lexile level 501 to 850, which is typically second to fourth grade. Um, and then three dots is 851 to 1100. And that is grades like five through eight. And then four dots is 1101 to and up. So these are your eighth graders and up. Um, so this is great. This is my like favorite. I love the leveling. You're giving choice right now and leveling. So maybe your reader is a, on a, a first grade level, but they still want to know what that other article is all about. So the great part is they can click on level two. It brings up the story and or the article or the news um, paper. And over to your right, you have your document options. So you have text to speech. You can change your font size, font design. And this is where they can translate it just the article to a different language. So um, if you have a child that is learning and but they're still struggling a little bit. So they're kind of learning um, all their vocab, but they're struggling and they may need to hear it um, in their home language. And of course, at the top, we have our document options. Like I said, these are more likely for your educators, librarians, teachers to use. Um, these are full citations of your, so kids that are researching, um, there's a full citation of publication, author, how many words are in the article level. Um, it also has the ability to share via Google. You can download, you can just print the article, which um, I do love having like a hard copy. Uh, they can use highlighters to go along, make notes. And our key thing is copying the link, yeah. right? We love that link. And I'll be honest, I love those citations in third to fifth grade world because uh, especially with Google life now, they like to just copy and paste the things <laughs> and they don't like to give anybody credit for it. So we're really <laughs> hitting citations hard and making sure that those kids know how to give credit where credit is due. So um, that's a great place for them to start practicing with that. Yeah. And it's nice because um, when you click the citations, it actually will show you four different formats. So there's like APA, there's mm -hmm. like the Harvard, Harvard. So it's, there's so many. Um, now my littles don't use it as much, but the great part is, is if you start showing them how to use this, our county has, you know, we have all of our libraries have this in our county. So if I start showing them now as, you know, K to second, by the time they get to a three to five school and then they get to middle school, man, they are cranking out some citations, some good work, <laughs> some good research using these same amazing e-resources. Um, so I'm, on the same page that your article was, if you scan down, and I didn't want to go through each of these, but you can see if you look under book articles, um, there's two articles that are have two dots, um, our level two, we have a level one, magazine articles, you can see their leveling, news articles, and our pictures. I mean, right away, these are all updated. So that article was updated as December 27th. Um, J-Lo and Ben Affleck, they had a blended family with a hummingbird themed um, Christmas. So, I mean, you're giving them all these choice, but they're like, hey, that's fun. You know, like now, of course, my second graders aren't going. They're not looking for that. But you know but what? Maybe my, but maybe my are. fifth graders are. So this is the cool part. Um, Gail in Context offers not only books, but all these magazine articles, current events, and they're all leveled. Like leveling work is a teacher's dream. When it's there, it just, it promotes your choice and your motivation. It promotes your differentiation. Mm -hmm. It's it's just so awesome. And of course, pictures are always a go-to and the related topics. So uh, the next thing is uh, National Geographic Kids. So we absolutely love using Nat Geo Kids. It's got the coolest things on here. I mean, there's so many high interest texts graphics, they have a lot of shareability options and activity ideas. And we use it in combination. Um, we will show you with our um, choice boards how we use them together. All right, so I'm not going to go over the same um, with because I'm sure you guys can see some of the icons are similar. Um, I do, they have the same sound, explore, browsing, search history, our Git yeah. link. We love that Git link. Um, but something that they do have that um, 
Gail in context, the Gail Elementary doesn't have is they have this filter result option, which is almost like an advanced option, um, but you can really scale it down. Nat Geo offers a lot of magazine articles. So of course they have a lot of information, but if I'm just strictly looking for hummingbirds, in these articles, I can filter out my options, which is what I did to get a little bit more. When I first put in um, hummingbirds, I had like 27 and then I kind of filtered it down and then I got 18 kids magazines. Um, so, and I was like, okay, this is, this is more manageable, right? I can set this up ahead of time if I need to, but over, we can, we can filter by anything from topic to publication title, person, author, subject. They have pictures, books, magazines. So all of these things are such great tools. And that's what we need to remember. These are tools that we can use and then show them how to use. So I clicked on my Hummingbird article. And um, one of the things I love the most is up to the top left corner. Um, this is a shortcut to your personal library homepage. So <clears throat> at Ken Island Elementary School, I have my own library homepage. I click on this. This takes me right to my homepage, my things, and specifically all my Gale product menu, which includes Nat Geo Kids. So, and this can be found, or it goes back to Gale Elementary. So I can flip back and forth pretty easily. It took me a little bit to find it. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. I'm doing like extra work. Like what's happening here? And I realized I could go back and forth through my homepage. So I know that um, a public library or a high school library, college library could do the same, which is pretty cool. And it's specifically to your school and your county, your district. Um, the next is our seeking options. I love, I love these because they have great icons. So that we call the three dashes, we call it the hamburger. Um, these are easy to use icons. It's not overwhelming, they're self-explanatory. You click on there, there's your table of contents. So if the kids want to go, if we're doing something like, okay, well, what page is this on? It's easy to click there. These are all very easy to navigate. Um, search hit terms. So maybe they're looking for like, oh, I want to see the baby animals. So they go on, they type it in. It takes it right to that section. The next is the dictionary, which is really cool because we know now that uh, there's a lot of big words and we have a lot of trouble with breaking down big words. Well, they can click this, they type that word in, they can highlight it from the text and bring it over and it gives them a full um, definition. And then again, the full citation. Over to the right is additional. So we can print, we have our full citation and we have the get link. Now, this is my fave. So the article options, um, text to speech is key. It's key for us, especially for the um, littles, but I know that um, I have a student, their family is, their second language is Spanish. I mean, their first language is Spanish, second language is English. And they asked one time about going over to the public library and if they, if they had something that could read to them. And I was like, absolutely, text-to-speech. A lot of people don't realize about the text-to-speech. So this one, you can hit play, zoom in, zoom out, full screen, and it has an autoplay. They can autoplay it or stop as they need to. I love the zoom in and out because you know they're going to want to see Moana. You know they're going to want to see the bear or the earth. So I love all the options that it has. It's so colorful. Look how inviting it is. Mm -hmm. I love it. All right. So with these text-to-speech options, which is, I just absolutely love this. You have your volume controls. Okay, super cool. But you can download the MP3 of the article and then you can embed that anywhere um, which is so neat. Um, you could put this in any kind of slide deck, a Google slide, you can send it. Um, this is, you know, if you have a student out for, that's out for the day or a week, or um, you can send all of this. And in the settings, you can control the speed of the speech, the color of the text, auto scrolling. I love that they highlight the words as it's reading. So they have done an awesome job of making this so um, easy to manipulate and to work with and accommodating, which is the key right now. We don't need anything else that's gonna frustrate them beyond what they're already frustrated about. So the options on here are awesome. Absolutely love it. So to kind of sum them up, at first I was like, okay, 
which one maybe is like kind of better? And I was like, well, really it's not a versus thing, right? They work so well hand in hand. And so they're available in over 30 languages. They're easy to navigate. Um, you can turn that sound on and off. You can scroll over with your cursor, it reads it aloud. You can choose topics that are leveled. Um, so here's your choice, here's your motivation. It's easy to identify the leveling, right? They don't make it too hard to do that. Um, if you choose an article that you want read aloud, once you push play, you can, the words are highlighted, you're reading with it. Um, so, and this makes it really easy for students to follow along with these. So, and we're talking about like, how, how can we help them be comfortable? Because we, want, we don't want them to feel like they're always working and this is work. Oh, I have to do this stuff, right? You want them to come back. We want them to come back and check it out on their own. And when you can download um, articles and you can listen and move and manipulate, I mean, they, these kinds of things is exactly what promotes their self-efficacy. Why, why is this important to me? Um, and I just, we love the programs together. I'm excited that um, you guys are getting ready to see what we do with it, so. Yeah, so I am going to be talking about choice and the e-resources. Obviously, Danielle just showed you like how awesome the, the awesomeness is, right? Um, but how do we make this choice manageable and productive for small humans? Going back to that SMILE acronym, that M, that me, how can we help them be successful so that we're not frustrating them, though they're not being overwhelmed? Um, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to set a little real life scenario. I, I have two kiddos of my own. I have um I have an eight-year-old daughter, Lainey, um, and I um a 10-year-old son, Gabe. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little scenario. Um, and this was kind of a wake-up call for me. Um, you're going to uh your your daughter just got a $20 bill from her grandmother for Chris for her birthday, right? And and she wants to go to Target. And um you go to Target and you're like, you can buy whatever you want with your $20 bill. <laughs> and two hours later, I'm standing in the Barbie aisle with a very overwhelmed and frustrated um, daughter. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this happening? Why? You can have anything you want. Um, and that, and I asked myself, why is this happening? Well, there she's overwhelmed by the amount of choices that are there. It's unreasonable to expect her to me to just take her into Target, her choose whatever she wants. I mean, I have a hard time choosing things in Target, right? Without choosing at all. Yeah. Um, so we have to make choices manageable for them. And while we love Gail and we love Nagio for all of the things that it can offer, we have to rein it in a little bit. Um, the same, this, this, we have to scaffold and give them choice situations that make it attainable. Otherwise we're promoting frustration and, and, and decreasing motivation. It's a really fine line. Um, we have scaffolded choices in so many places in our libraries and in our school settings. Um, you know, when our primary schools get their fresh kindergartners every year, we're, you're not letting them run into the library and choose whatever book they want. Um, they're choosing a handful of books and putting them out so that we don't have little Johnny roaming around the fiction, uh, the uh, reference section and coming to you with an encyclopedia that he wants <laughs> to check out. Um, so we're managing some of their choices for them. And while we're still giving them that perceived choice, um, we're giving them ways to be successful with it. So I'm going to share a couple of examples of way that we give some choice, some structure. Um, our first example I'm going to share with you is an upcoming project-based research unit that we're going to be engaging all of our K to five students in across our county. Um, and this is using the story Crossings um, by Katie DeField. And this is one of our Black Eyed Susan nominees this year, and it addresses the creation of man-made structures that protect animals from human advancement, such as building natural bridges over highways. Um, this is a hot. This is a hot book. All of our kids want to read it. They're really <laughs> excited um, because they all love animals. Um, but in this project, our students are going to be researching animals first and then using what they've learned to design and build structures that will protect animals from humans and other dangerous situations. Now, obviously, at our kindergarten level, we're talking like they're building it with Legos or blocks or something. All right. Our fifth graders are building much more realistic um, types of prototypes. Um, but it all starts with the research. So my first example is going to be for our 
our younger ones, our first and second graders, and how we're going to let them dive into research, but do it in a controlled situation, in a scaffolded situation. Um, and so we, cur we curate these choice boards to help make research attainable and successful. So we're promoting their motivation. Um, you see here, I'm going to click into this so that um, I can bring up the actual choice board and we can interact with it here. Um, my thing's in the way. Um, sorry, you know, it's taking it, a minute. Yeah, but you know, like um, we were, we've talked about this so much with choice boards, like, and a lot of people are overwhelmed. They think like, oh, this is, it's, it's too hard. Like that's a lot of work, but it's, once you do it, then you have it. Yeah. And it's, it's a tool it's, that you can use. So my choice board for whatever reason isn't going into sharing mode, but we're going to roll on. Um, so this is what we might present to our little, to our, our younger friends. And you can see here, we have about four animals and we would choose these animals. Oh, oh. We would choose these animals based on um, polling our students to see where most of their interests lie. Um, you might have more than four, you might have um, you know, eight or so. You don't want to get too crazy with the choices with our younger ones. Again, we don't want target situation. We don't want them to be overwhelmed. We want to give them some options though. Um, so I'm going to click here. Once we, they get this, they're going to click on one of the animals that they choose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select bears here. And this is going to take me to the next slide in um, our research choice board. Um, the kids would be able to interact with this and click on some of these links that we've captured from Gail and from Nat Geo. You can see here, I have Gail, I have Nat Geo. We also include Epic and Pebble Go. These are two other options that our kids use frequently. Um, they may also have capstone eBooks and other things in here that um, we, we would pull from. But for this, I have included Gail and Nat Geo. Um, and when I click on, say, grizzly bears is the choice that they're making. This is going to take me directly into um, the article, and it's taking me right, maybe, is thinking <laughs> about it. It's getting there. There we go. Um, this is going to take me directly into that leveled um, article. And while I'm going right into the article, the object of this is that um, we want to get them right to where they need to be as opposed to that searching process. Remember, we're talking about six, seven, eight-year-olds here. We don't want them kind of browsing around and going into 80 different places to get to here. We just want them to get here first. Now, eventually, we are going to want them to be searching and navigating Gail independently, um, but these kiddos just aren't there yet. In other lessons, we're going to be modeling and instructing them on how to do that. But for this activity, we're keeping the focus directed. Um, I, we start with the level one text here, but because we're here, we have lots of options still. We can go into our level two text if that kiddo wants some more information. We have lots of information here that they can use. Um, so they are able to navigate sort of in a controlled setting, but giving them still some choice making, giving them options to feel successful. If we go back to our choice board, they can also choose the polar bear instead. Um, and that also takes us right into that Gale article. So using that directed link that we can capture right there from our, um, from our um, old copy link. Yeah, our copy <laughs> link, it's a good one, uh, good tool there. So again, and they have access to that level one and level two. So if they're like, oh, I still want some more information, they can click on that level two, use that text to speech and they can access it that way too. Um, and then our Nat Geo, um, we love Nat Geo, right? So in this case, I'm actually opening this up right into the search results when I searched for bears. Um, we, again, streamlining that process, getting them right to that access point, as opposed to them kind of clicking through, we want them to maintain focus. Um, but still with more choice, because yes. now you have koala bears and other stuff, you know, yes. but still that, that focus is there. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to our choice board here. You can, like I said, you can see that we have Epic and Pebble Go in there, but let's go back now 
and let's ratchet it up. Okay, that was our that was our uh, first and second grade. This is more for our three, third to fifth graders. And you can see I have eight choices here. Now, this could have 12. This could have 14. It's really going to be based on who you're working with. And we, of course, pulled these based on student polling of animals that they're interested in. Um, so I want to show you our bears example again um, so that you can see the difference between what it looked like at the one to two grade level and then at the three to four grade level. Now we go in here. Now you see that our Gale only has one icon to click on. And that's because instead of taking them to that direct link, we're taking them into the entry point. So again, not getting them to the point where they're searching and clicking and trying to get to bears, but um, taking them directly to bears so that they can now navigate in here, keeping that focus um, but giving them, still giving them those choices. Once they're here, obviously a ton of choices, right? We can look at the book articles and magazine articles. My kids love the keep reading button because it's a nice, easy access. One click, boom, you're in an article. Um, where so they find their levels. Yep, where they can find their levels there. So this is really great and a great way for them to be successful. Back into our choice board again. My Nat Geo here is the same. I'm taking them right into that search. Um, access point so that they can see what is there for bears. And, you know, I love, what I love about Nat Geo is um, some of these videos. These are, mm -hmm. these are so awesome, a way to really rope these kids into what they're learning and, and feed that curiosity. Well, and we have found too that, um, the, that there are some videos um, with Gail, but the videos with Nat Geo kids are like the length that they are, are perfect mm -hmm. for like their span, right? Mm -hmm. They're not too right. long and they're just keyed right to the article. They're short videos, just enough. And they make it very easy to move on to like the next one or even to go back. Yeah. So, and while we're not addressing Pebble Go or Epic or anything today, you can see my, my um, choices here with Pebble Go have, have expanded as well, giving them some more choice as we ratchet this up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um. For my fifth graders, um, I take a little bit of a different stance instead of a choice board. Um, for our for my library here at Kennard, um, I use a Google site, and this gives them direct access into um, into some of our options as far as research goes. Um, I like to link everything on the page, and this page is bookmarked to their bookmark bars on their Chromebook, so they have access to it all the time. They access it from their classroom. They can access it in the library. Um, they have direct access to it. And here, we're giving them the reins now on the research. However, we're giving them direct access. They're not having to access this from some other point. I'm clicking on Gala Elementary in context, and this is going to take me right to that main page. So now we're still keeping that focus, limiting distractions, but giving them all of the choice that they can have. Um, it's really our what this I love this because this is our one stop shop. I always call it our one stop shop. And um, you can see even here um, what I'm getting ready to talk to you in a minute is everything is housed right here for them to click on. So they're not having to navigate somewhere else because when you start putting that into play, game over. Um, <laughs> it's just too much. Yeah, it is yeah. too much. Um, all right. So moving out of a project specific um, research, I wanted to share with you kind of a more practical, not practical, but a fun approach to this. Um, uh, this every month I curate a um, a choice board for my students, um, and. If some of you follow Sharon McClintock Miller, she is um, a school library media specialist um, out in the Midwest. And she was sort of my inspiration for use of choice boards. And it really all started here with this monthly choice boards. Um, so every month I curate a new choice board for them um, that they use either during their class times or during their library times that give them some library-based choices, um, but still giving them some structure. Um, in the library, my students use this as part of their rotations. Um, they're either engaging in the choice board um, or they're visiting Makerspace or they're doing a STEAM or a literacy center or they're doing book checkout. So this is one piece of our big puzzle. But I wanted to show you how I use Gale and Nat Geo in here. Um, 
One thing I think we can all agree on is that <laughs> students really believe that databases are only there when their teacher tells them to go there. Um, and that there, it's only there for assignments and projects. They don't use it as a place to investigate their own curiosities. And that as part of our standards in the school library, helping them develop that opportunity to find information to develop their own curiosities and, and find their own answers for their curiosities is really key. Um, but they all think that that's what's Google, that, that's Google's job, right? Yeah. And we're just going to Google that question. But instead, how can we use these to kind of get to a deeper and more reliable information base? Um, so I'm going to show you how I package these into my choice boards. It's kind of like hiding the veggies and the mac and cheese. Um, so I want to draw your attention over here to the celebrate column of the choice board. And um, I include the celebrate it used to be titled learn and i realized that many of the students were ignoring it um they weren't choosing it because it said learn so i um that means work yeah Learning right means work but every month i was including some sort of celebration so i was like let's just change the word let's rebrand this and call it celebrate and it generated a lot more interest um so this month we're celebrating black history month and president's day so i've included an article here from from gail for black history month and when we click on it, it is a direct link. It's taking us, oh, oh I forgot to click on my choice board first. Um, it's taking us, maybe. <laughs> um, Sorry, public school internet, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, <laughs> while you're clicking that, I'll let you know. So for ours in the K2, um, I only would give like those four, like four choices, mm -hmm. right? Instead of eight. And um. And I would probably put instead of two articles, I'd put one of each mm -hmm. and it kind of just gets them in there. So when they go on and I would leave this choice board for us, for the littles, because she has her homepage up with all those, um, what'd you call it? Your one-stop shop. One shop and where I would have this set as my background, mm -hmm. right? For their computer. So that, so they just click on something and then the choice board comes up. They have one icon, one desktop um, icon, and then they pop up. And then this can stay all month long mm -hmm. and it's, they can use it. They can access it. Like Heather was saying from anywhere in the school, mm -hmm. um, this is on their own time. And we actually find that they will go to the, their choice board mm -hmm. during their free time in their classroom, yeah. which is really cool. And we have a lot of, I have a lot of teachers who turn to this as well as for part of their must do's and may do's in their classroom is definitely something that they turn to quite a bit. Um, so now that we, we got our article up here, um, what I find has the most impact here is that they are now engaging in these articles completely free of an assignment. They are reading this just because they are intrigued and want to read it. There's no pressure to produce something or to create something or to use this for some other purpose like answering questions. And um, that's sort of the beauty of um, school library setting in, in some places. I, if, if I were using this in the classroom, um, I would probably have to ask them 10 questions about this in order to, to make sure that they were reading it and reading it for information here. I just want them to explore it. I want them to get engaged. I want them to be motivated and feel successful with it. Um, for um, my president's day, um, I have created, I've embedded like a second choice board here. And as, as I've been in the library, uh, these kind of grow and change as the years go by. And um, so here, here's my President's Day choice board. Um, and these guys up here, these are Nat Geo resources and the kids don't even know it, which is awesome. So they click on these and we go right into these books about presidents and they just eat this up because this pops up and they're like, oh, hey, it's Nat Geo. Like, <laughs> then they're like, oh my gosh, it's kind of like selling it to them because they're like, yes, I love Weird But True. But Weird But True is always checked out in Miss Gray's library. So maybe I can read my Weird But True on <laughs> Nat Geo now. So, um, and, and they can get it from anywhere. Yeah. Like that, it's, it's so much cooler. And I know we like probably like totally nerd out on this stuff. But when you see a kid that is not really your reader or wants to like do it, and then you see them over there like having a blast and they don't even realize that they're using like these amazing e-resources like Nat Geo Kids and Gail, like, and they don't even know that they're like having fun and reading mm -hmm. because it's something they want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I mean, that's why we just felt so, um, I guess, 
like compelled. intrigued and compelled to like do this and share this because we're having so much fun with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I know, uh, this choice board I like love and our public librarian was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Cause I need a way to connect with our like youth that's coming in and you can do this right in the public libraries. This doesn't have to be associated with just in your classroom or mm -hmm. in the school. And you can do this with adults. I mean, I remember, um, you know, going in one time and watching, um, it was in a middle school and they were using it and it had their, basically their classes on a choice board. And then they could go in and work on stuff. I mean, you can really make it any age. It's the, the concept of the choice board is awesome. Yeah. So, um, so obviously this is super motivating for our kids. They really have free access to kind of click and learn and engage. I encourage them to visit all of these things every month. Um, you know, please choose for, for one thing from every column, but they do it and they can investigate it and they can live it and breathe it and not have to feel like someone's going to ask them 50 questions afterwards. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Heather and, yeah. and uh, sure. thank you for this presentation. Oh. I am finding it completely fascinating <laughs> and it's, it's among the best presentations on an e-resource that I've ever been at, oh, but thank now, you. now we have to wrap things up. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. This was our last That's slide. After after this. This. Last slide. Yeah. Good timing. Good timing. Yeah. Oh, okay. There, there we are. <laughs> we we have um, a first a question from the uh, audience. Uh, there are two questions. Um, do you have any suggestions for new teachers on using these tools and approaches in classes where kids are at really desperate disparate reading levels without getting overwhelmed and losing track of kids at the farthest ends of the continuum? Uh, yeah. Wait, uh, a little I, bit I, more tips for planning in advance for teachers who want to try choice boards but are struggling to differentiate instruction oh wow those are deep those are some deep ones i yeah. mean I, th I feel like we could do presentations on both of those questions, <laughs> All of those know, questions. i think um to start um kudos to whoever asked that mm -hmm. because that's tough and I know um, I taught in a Title I school. I had fifth graders that were on a grade level one reading. And then I had fifth graders that were reading in a seventh and eighth grade. And then they hand you these like 26 students are like, have fun, um, try to figure it out. So um, it's hard, but you're doing hard work and um, it can be overwhelming. And sometimes I feel like one of the students in my class and that's kind of why I have to like, narrow it down. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion would be to take one part. So we have kind of figured out how to use both of them, but both of them are such great resources that maybe just start with one, just start mm -hmm. with one, take a look at their levels and their capabilities. So um, I don't know, we use IRIs um, in our school to figure out their reading level. Possibly you could um, use any kind of the download print down or even um, the text to speech and the different levels, but overwhelming with um, I guess Heather would probably be better to talk to the with the choice board mm -hmm. um, because I know that it can feel overwhelming. Right. Um, Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> uh, um, can you repeat that question back to me again, just so I can make sure I'm answering what um, I was thinking? Are, the question is looking for suggestions for new teachers yes. on using these tools and approaches in classes where kids are at disparate reading levels mm -hmm. without getting overwhelmed and losing track of kids at the farthest end of the continuum. Yeah. Um, another question that you might answer at the same time is, uh, what did you use to make the choice board? Like, could you share a link about how to make a choice board? Oh, um, so my, my choice boards are just created in, in, um, Google. in Google slides. Um, okay. a lot of, a lot of it involves just a lot of, um, screenshotting yeah. and cutting and pasting, and then yeah. using that pasted thing to then link it to the Gale resource. Um, and I think, you know, going back to that question of, and I think she answered a lot of it, those trying to keep track okay. and, and, and the kids on various reading levels. I think that's what I love most about Gail is because you have that level one, that level two, and they're both about bears. So, you know, we, we can yes. see those kids who need that most, the most help at that level one. And they're also the, on the level two, they're getting really identical and for really 
similar information. They're looking at the same screen. So it feels less like, oh, well, Johnny over here, he's reading at a level two and I'm reading at a level one. And I feel really bad for myself because their screens look very similar. So yeah. I do love that about Gail. I would say what um, Danielle was saying, kind of really bring it in, really hone in on what it is that you um, are look, want them to be reading about and then start there and build out. And okay. I would also tell you, we have, we both put our emails up there. I I'm sure as you could tell, we are not quiet people. <laughs> uh, we enjoy well, talking and sharing. I okay. would uh, happily uh, do uh, that. Yeah. Share. One, one last question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. What, how can public librarians support you in doing this work? Support. Oh, oh, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank <laughs> you for that. Um, you know, I think Passing along, you guys are kind of on the ground floor on a lot of this stuff, and you get a lot more than we we get to see sometimes. So just passing along the new stuff and then the hot button stuff, passing it along to us is great because honestly, we're in our book caves a lot of the times, and and we're we're wearing twelve hats. So passing along stuff to us is great. But um, on Danielle's point, um, we left our emails up there. If you want to reach out to us, I'm happy to share some of these choice boards and stuff that I've created. So you have a jumping off point because of permissions with the schools. It's kind of tricky for me to just generally share it out. But um, if you email me, I'm happy to, to send it out to you. And we also kind of have like a how to Thank make you. a choice board um, and kind of just like create the Google slide, do this. Because I remember like when I first started doing it as well, I felt really overwhelmed. You know, I'm coming from the classroom teacher point and I was like, oh my gosh, and I have students that are from this grade to this grade and I have to hit them all. And I realized like I'm making this way more difficult for myself um, where I could just open up of my a google slide mm -hmm. and then i can screenshot cut and paste yeah. like back to almost basics where then i was like oh wait a second look at me oh i got this because now i can beautify it and it looks all amazing but um i will happily mm -hmm. i we would love to help and share um one thing real quick i think we were saying um back to the public library and so my, our public library on Ken island um her name is julie she has kids in college so she was kind of out of the loop I was like, look, what can we do to help each other? And I told her if they're seeing the same thing in the public library as they're seeing in mine, they are going to get so much better about researching and looking and knowing how to navigate because both our public library and our schools have access to these e-resources that we're using. So that's the awesome part because if we work together and I'm kind of sharing my stuff with her, um, cause what I'll do is we kind of did it today. <laughs> we will make our choice board, but then we'll share it to our public, mm -hmm. like our personal accounts, and then we can share it with them. Mm -hmm. And then they're kind of seeing the, the kids are like, oh, I didn't get enough time. I only see you an hour a week. And then they go to the public library and it's there for them. So it's kind of just sharing. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I think we've, we've all it. learned a lot from your program and, uh, I I'm actually going to watch the rerun. <laughs> yeah. So she's putting our emails again in the chat yes. um, for you guys. Um, I again, thank you guys. We were so nervous about this today. We weren't sure about like our audience. We're like, you know, we said elementary school teachers, you know, are kind of crazy, have, have lots of energies, and and we were just worried that like we were like, oh, not sure how this is going to go. But um, we had fun with it. We absolutely loved it. Had fun, and we would be happy to help anybody that wants more help. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. And now we have to end this session so we can go on to the next. Yeah. Session, <laughs> have a great is afternoon. One that guys. I'm involved in. We're going to be talking about uh, licensing and contracts and uh, managing an e resource collection. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.